you are worth it. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I was speaking, I said, well, we, we learnt that we, the way we can walk in a manner worthy of God, walk in a way that pleases him, do the things that we would want to do, is when we understand who we are. When we know who we are, we know our identity and we know who God is. We know how much he loves us. And I finished up by saying that he would say to us, you're worth it. He's invested his Holy Spirit, who is God, into you. So it doesn't matter. It's not the building that the Holy Spirit is now in. It's not a temple made of stones and rocks. It's not even a temple that's made of leaders and elders. It's a temple made of you, living stones. You are the temple. You are the place where the Holy Spirit dwells. And God deemed it, deemed you worth it to put his Holy Spirit in you, to put that new life into you. There's no, no other plan, no other way, no other people but you. You are the children of God. Isn't that exciting? Yes. He loves us so much. And yet he doesn't put the burden of religion on us. He doesn't say, because you're, you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got to do this, 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 and this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this. He sets us free from all that. So we can walk in a manner worthy because we know and we understand. And we looked at uh, a passage in Colossians chapter 1. Just going to refresh our memory. It says, For this reason, and this is Paul writing to the Colossians, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. So this is a, a good prayer. This is a New Testament prayer that we can pray. And ask, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen? Amen. So here we have it. Um, it's in the New King James now, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> what an investment. <laughs> Here we see, you know, it's not a burden. It's not do good, do good, do good. It's do good. Walk in a worthy manner because you, you have understanding, because you can pray for spiritual understanding, spiritual wisdom. And sometimes those terms sound a bit highfalutin, don't they? You know, it sounds like they're the things that the elders do. They spend their time with spiritual wisdom and understanding. But this is pertaining to every member of the church. This is every Holy Spirit-filled member of the body. And I don't know how many of you did the um, homework I did about a month ago where you had to declare to yourself <laughs> that God made him who knew no sin to be on sin on my behalf, that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. How many people did that at the time? And how many people carried on doing it? And has your understanding changed? More revelation? Oh, no. You need to keep doing it then. You need to keep doing it. Because that's Bible study. Read it. Meditate it. Talk over it. Discuss it with the Lord. Speak it to yourself in the, in the mirror. Look at yourself and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Speak the truth over your life. Don't let the <coughs> devil bring you down with lies. Don't don't get dragged down with religion and condemnation. Be set free. I know when I do it, I, I, I get released when I start bringing scripture into my life and speaking truth over my life, whatever particular area that might be. There's so many scriptures that we can, you know, just easy, simple ones that we've, we know, but we don't think about. And we can use those scriptures, just take one like that and just um, talk it over to yourself. If it's something about yourself, then then talk it, talk it, talk it. Just keep ministering it to yourself and understand it. That's how we get understanding. Don't be frightened to read it. Amen? I wasn't planning to say that, but I think it's really important that you, know, you are the body, we are the body. We need to nurture ourselves, we need to feed. But we also have this opportunity to come together and, and learn even more and, and take that spiritual wisdom and understanding and bring it to another level and upgrade it, as I like to say. We're going to upgrade our understanding this morning. We're going to 
download new understanding from the Holy Spirit is connected to all and each and every one of us. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. You all probably heard this. This is one that they put on your ashtrays and your soap dishes. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and you could probably quote it, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your, direct your paths. What a wonderful promise, yeah? Superb promise. How many people know that off by heart? Yeah, so you can remember it. So that's one you could start on all straight away, isn't it? But I was thinking about this and following on from what we were thinking about a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, trusting in the Lord is something that we kind of encourage one another and say, oh, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord, you know. And, and it's important that we do that, isn't it? And it says, don't lean on your own understanding. So we, we realise that our own understanding, the way we look at the world maybe, our thoughts, our flesh, whatever you want to call it, might not be in tune with what God is saying and it might um, blur or fog the view that you're having of the world. So you might be facing a circumstance at the moment and trying to trust God in it and you're seeing it a certain way and you're trying to trust God in that situation. How many people have been in that situation? And sometimes it can feel like what God is saying, to me anyway, is like he's putting a blindfold on me and just saying, trust me. And I'm kind of thinking, well, I can't lean on my own understanding because I can't see my understanding's gone. I take my understanding away. I don't lean on my own understanding. And I'm wandering around like this, like a blind man not being able to see. And another good example might be if I had a child come up here and I turned them round in front of me and, and I asked them, I said, right, you're going to fall back into my arms and I'm going to catch you. If I did that to Esther, she'd probably do it. I'm not going to do it with you, Samuel, because <laughs> you wouldn't do it. <laughs> but if I did it to a child that didn't know me, they probably wouldn't want to do it, would they? Because they don't know me, they don't understand me, they don't know if, if I would catch them, they weren't, wouldn't be quite sure, they wouldn't trust me, maybe. Whereas if it was my own child and they were small enough, <laughs> they would know that I would catch them, they would trust. So I think this, this scripture really needs to be um, opened up a bit and we're not just saying, don't lean on your own understanding, we need to replace that with a new understanding. So we're not just saying, don't understand, wipe your mind of anything, of any thoughts, and just blindly go on and hope, by hope, that God's going to do something. But it means, don't lean on your own understanding, lean on the truth. And if you think, well, no, come on, Brian, that's not what the Bible's saying, it doesn't say that there. If you just flick to the next slide, which is the two verses prior to that, you'll see that if you read it in context, what Saul, uh, not Saul, Solomon was saying to his son, was saying, my son, do not forget my law, my teachings, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. <coughs> let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favour and high esteem in the sight of God and man. So what he was saying to his son was, you know, you've got to have understanding, you've got to have teaching, you've got to have words, you've got to understand, uh, he calls them laws and commands and truth, but all these things lead him, lead his son to understand so that he's no longer leaning on his own understanding, but leaning on the things that his father has told him in this case. But we lean on what God tells us. Our understanding should come from God and not <coughs> lean on our own understanding. <clears throat> so if we could just flip back to the Colossians verse, this ties in with what we were thinking about. If you want to walk in a manner worthy, then we don't lean on our own understanding. We lean on his understanding. And that last bit there says, may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So it's a two-part thing. It's not just not leaning on your own understanding. It's leaning on his understanding. 
taking wisdom, taking spiritual understanding from the scriptures, understanding what God is like, understanding who you are. It won't just jump out the page and chase you down the kitchen. We have a saying, Rosie and I have a saying in our house, when, when I get home or when Rosie gets home, we, we either do it if, if the chocolate biscuit tin is slightly empty <laughs> and one of us has been at the chocolate biscuits, we say, oh yeah, well they just jumped out the cupboard and chased me down the kitchen and jumped into my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but scripture won't do that. The Bible won't chase you down. You need to chase it down. You need to read these things. As simple as just finding a verse and reading it and reading it and imbibing it. And, and understanding. It's about understanding who God is, the knowledge of his love, how much he thinks of you, how much he's done for you. Then you'll walk in a manner worthy. Then he'll make your path straight. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that exciting? Yes. We can have that understanding. We can have that spiritual wisdom. We don't have to be highfalutin elders. We don't have to be um, theologians. We just need to be spirit-filled Christians and the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. All things. Not some things, not a few things, not the things that might help you. All things he will teach you if you just imbibe yourself, just rest in his understanding and lean not on your own understanding. Amen? Amen. So we're going to have a bit of fun now. <laughs> we're going to go to uh, John chapter 6. And this, this is a story of um, Jesus feeding, I think it's the 5,000, not the 4,000. And I have to add at this time because for some reason it's in the Bible and, and every time anyone preaches on they say, it's not just 5,000, it's 5,000 men plus women and children. <laughs> As if 5,000 people wasn't enough. <laughs> I don't know. I think 5,000 people is a lot to feed, um, you know, five loaves and two fish, but... We, we have to add that in anyway. But this is the story, you all know it, so I'm not going to read all through it, but this is the story where all the people are hungry, they've been listening to Jesus, and he feeds them this amazing miracle. It's incredible, five loaves and two fish. Um, and one, Once I did try and just, out of interest, I just sort of tried to do a calculation, and I haven't brought any props this morning, but if there were 5,000 people just 5,000, I'm sorry, ladies and children. <laughs> but even if it were just 5,000 and you had five reasonable sized loaves um, and two fish, and then I thought, well, if you mathematically cut that down, pro rated it for those mathematicians in, in, and got down to how much bread would that be to feed this group of people here? Uh, and then I, I brought it in when I said this last time and it, and it was like a crumb. <laughs> So you can imagine we had like a crumb between all us lot. That's, that's what Jesus would have used to feed all us. So it it's really just kind of focuses your mind on how big a miracle it was, how amazing a thing that he did. Superb, yes. So anyway, we read uh, these two verses, uh, is it two verses? No, a few verses from John chapter 6. First, starting at verse 4, so we're just going to read a little part of this story. That's the background of what Jesus was doing. And he says, Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread, that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii, which, uh, I don't know, that's money. Two hundred monies worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, and I'm sure there's some significance to that statement, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so the men sat down, notice the men, in number about 5,000, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. 
and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. And we know the story that everybody had more than enough to eat, and when they were finished, this is the Sunday school question, how many loaves, how many baskets full of leftovers did they have left over? Great, you've been to Sunday school, well done. <laughs> but, I want to just have a think about something. So we're thinking about leaning on your own understanding and not leaning on your own understanding. And the world and you know, thoughts in the world will give us lots of different ways of thinking, lots of cognitive therapy going on at the moment in the world, um, and lots of understandings of how to look at situations, how to assess situations, how to manage things, how to manage depression and anxiety and all these things. And I'm not saying they're bad things, but they are out there, all these philosophies, thoughts and processes that people have to deal with. How many people, be honest, love to be around an optimist? About half the room. How many people love to be around a pessimist? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody wants to be around a pessimist, do they? And I know because I've been a pessimist and crumbs, you, you lose your friends quick. <laughs> People don't want to be around pessimists, do they? Because they're always bemoaning. And... Whereas an optimist is a good person to have around. Well, it seems, seems to be, doesn't it? They always seem a bit more positive about things. And that's one of the things that you know, world philosophy teaches at the moment, isn't it? Being positive. Don't take negative thoughts. Be positive. Uh, be an optimist. Um, when faced with two really bad choices, a pessimist will always choose both. You can laugh at that point. That was a Jewish proverb, apparently. <laughs> a pessimist thinks every flower is a weed. An optimist thinks every weed is a flower. A pessimist forgets to laugh. An optimist laughs to forget. Just some proverbs that I looked up. So we've got an optimist and a pessimist. And in this story, if we go back to the beginning of the story, we see the first person in this story is Philip. And it seems like, certainly in this situation, Philip is a pessimist. Because he says, where are we going to buy bread for all these people? He's not very happy about this situation and he just sees it as a, a lost cause, a lost situation. How many times have you been in a situation where you just think, no? How much optimism have you got? But he's a pessimist. If we drop down and we come to Andrew, now Andrew's an optimist. Because he says, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. And then he says, but what are they to feed so many people? But he's an optimist. He kind of sees something that might be positive in that situation. And that's what optimists do, don't they? They look and they, they look for something positive in the situation. And the way I kind of look at it is, if you imagine the situation and it's a mist, because you're not sure what to do. It's not a helpful situation. It might be a hard situation and it's like a mist and you're looking in this mist and you don't know what to do. And the optimist tries to look over the mist. And the pessimist tries to look under the mist. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been a pep pessimist, a peptimist? <laughs> don't know what peptimist is. <laughs> Somebody who doesn't like peppermints maybe. If you look, un a pessimist will always say, if you ever heard anyone say, well, if I think the worst, then I can't be disappointed. Have you ever said that or heard someone say that? I used to say that and you think, well, it's true, I suppose, but you end up being disappointed anyway because you're a pessimist, don't you? <laughs> so it's kind of a, it's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy or whatever, but yeah. So the optimist looks over the mist and the pessimist looks under the mist. So it's a pessimist and an optimist. But here comes Jesus, 
Jesus trusts in the Lord, doesn't lean on his own understanding, doesn't lean on his human nature, but he acknowledges God. He gives thanks for the bread. He knows what's going to happen. It says he tested him because he knew, and that word knew in the Greek means he saw it, he perceived what would happen. He perceived that God could do something in that situation. That's his spiritual wisdom and understanding. He knew what his father was like. He knew his father was a provider. He knew his father wanted to do good things for them. So with his spiritual wisdom and understanding, he knew what was going to happen in the situation or what could happen if he wanted it to happen. So Jesus actually wasn't an optimist. He didn't need to look over the situation. He wasn't a pessimist. I call Jesus a senomist. He was a senomist because he looked and he saw no mist. <laughs> and when you've got spiritual understanding, when you've got wisdom and you know what God is like, when you understand how much he loves you, when you understand the truth of your nature, you're more likely to be a senomist. You're more likely to see the situation the way God wants you to see it and not as an optimist or as a pessimist. So although I, I do like to be around optimists and they're nice people to be around, ultimately Andrew's answer was not the answer. It was an optimistic, positive answer. But ultimately it was not the answer. The answer was spiritual understanding. The answer was to look and see no mist in the situation. So I don't know if that helps. <laughs> There's my play on words, but when we don't lean on our own understanding, it means we're trusting in the truth and we're upgrading our trust. As I would say, we're upgrading it to full HD. We're bringing high definition into our trust. We're understanding situations better because we know him, we understand him. We don't lean on our own understanding but we bind the truth around our necks. We imbibe what God is saying to us. We receive the truth through the Holy Spirit that's living in us. <coughs> Amen? And you are the children of God. You're the ones with the Holy Spirit in you. You are the senomists. <coughs> so if you can't think, remember anything else today, remember you're a senomist. You're not, not an optimist, you're not a pessimist, you're a senomist. And in every situation you can say, Lord, open my eyes to see your plan, to see, understand your wisdom in this situation. I'm not going to be positive like the world. I'm certainly not going to be negative. I'm going to be a senomist. The same mind is in me as is in Christ. Amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says... This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you shall no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. So again, this, this idea of walking, walking out your salvation, walking in a manner worthy of God, without rules, without efforts, walking in a manner worthy. Don't longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, of their thinking. So it starts in their thinking. You know, we're trying hard in the world to be cognitive, trying to be positive. We're trying to have all these thought processes. That's the thinking. But they have their understanding darkened. It says they have their understanding. They don't understand God. They don't understand what God has done for them. And they become alienated, separated from the life, the Zoe life, the whole well-being life of God. Because they're ignorant. Ignorant that is in them and because of their blind, the blindness of their hearts. So this blindness in their hearts is like the mist that veils what they see and what we see. And even as Christians, we walk in that mist, but no longer do we have to when we receive understanding, when we learn who God is, when we learn who we are, when we get that understanding. We don't walk in the futility of our thinking anymore. Amen? We understand, and we are, we're not alienated from the life of God. We are walking in it. We are living it out, we're receiving it, the abundance of life. Amen? So I'm just going to ask 
Julie to come and we're going to stand together. If you can bear to stretch your legs once more. I'm just going to pray a prayer because I really feel that this is a, a conscious decision by us. You know, you're, we are the church, aren't we? We are the people of God. I can stand up here or people can stand up here and say this is what we should do. But we have to choose to understand. We have to choose to be a scenomist. We have to walk in a manner worthy. And we want to do that. I really believe we want to do that. So let's stand together and I'm going to say this prayer. The psalmist in Psalm 91, famous one, says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. But he says in verse 2, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And we want to trust God, don't we? We want to upgrade our trust in God. Mm. Amen. Mm. But Father, we thank you that you have brought revelation into us, that each and every one of us has the presence, the teaching power, and the, the relevant downloading of the Holy Spirit in us, that we can see things in a different way because we understand who you are, Lord. And we choose, we choose to be a part of that. We choose to let the Holy Spirit teach us. So then if you want to say after me just a few lines of prayer, then just say them after me if you agree with what I say. Father, I thank you that you have given me your Holy Spirit. I'm so chuffed that he's with me. That he gives me understanding. And I want to download more. I want to understand more of what you're like, Father, and who I am in Christ. in Christ. And I will say to the Lord, and I will say to the Lord my refuge and my fortress, my, refuge and my, fortress. My, God, my God, in whom I trust. In whom I trust. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.